Here we go. All right, great. Well, welcome everyone for this Q&A session with Jamie Gorman. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, Jamie, I'll give you a chance to introduce yourself here in a second. Uh, but, you know, I, um, I was privileged to interview Jamie a couple, couple of weeks ago for Common Grounds. And that interview will be posted, I guess, in a couple of months. But um, it was so interesting talking to you, Jamie, that I felt like, wow, you know, we need to have a, a Q&A to talk more about this incredible book that you edited. I guess you wrote part of it, but you edited a lot of it as well. And uh, the book is a Slavery's Long Shadow, Race and Reconciliation in American Christianity. And I thought your book is just so... Um, this book is incredible. I mean, it's a must read. Yes, here it is. All right. So I'll just, you know, introduce the discussion, facilitate along with my friend Otoma. So um, just to introduce myself to all of you, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Nadine Templer. I'm part of the International Church of Christ. I work for an organization called Hope Worldwide, which is a nonprofit uh, that is connected to the International Churches of Christ. Um, and yeah, I live in Kathmandu, Nepal. My husband is a diplomat for the US government. So we are self-supported missionaries. Um, so that's me and Otoma, if you want to say a few words. Yeah, I guess just very briefly, uh, my name is Otoma Eji. I'm here in Detroit, Michigan. So we're kind of uh, spanning the globe these days. Um, I just wanted to say a couple words. I was asked to help kind of co-host this with the Nadine. I'm very excited just for this conversation because it kind of traces back some history of the restoration movement. Uh, some of the challenges that our church has faced as far as slavery and some of the ways they navigated it very well, but also some of the uh, impacts it has for us today. And I think that's the biggest part of the conversation is sometimes we uh, dissociate the past from the present and we say, well, that was a long, long time ago, but there's still repercussions. And I think this discussion done right can be very helpful and edifying to us. So I'm very glad that Jamie is able to join us. Great. And uh, Jamie, would you like to introduce yourself? I, yeah, I mean, I can say a, a few words for sure. Yeah. So first of all, thank you all for um, the invite and appreciate those who have um, showed up to part uh, participate or, or to listen either way. And, and those who watch later on, um, this is a really important conversation. I probably came to this conversation a little bit late. So I'm a historian. I'm trained as a historian. Um, I uh, have roots in both the um, acapella churches of Christ and the independent Christian churches. Um, and I've gone to schools of both. And uh, I really got into history and the history of the Stone Campbell movement, and the history of American religion, when I was at Abilene Christian University studying with um, Doug Foster and others there. And so Doug Foster, I continue to uh, see him as my major um, academic mentor. And so he's one, he's the one that really introduced me to these things, but it wasn't really later. It wasn't until, I mean, I had done my P I did my PhD at Baylor, uh, in, in the history of Christianity. And it was later when, um, the, the other, the co-editors of this book, who were my former professors and colleagues of Doug, Doug's, um, Jeff Childers and Mark Hamilton invited me to, to participate in doing, helping put together a book that would honor Doug and honor his life's work. And so as we began brainstorming, um, it was probably about an hour in when we, when we decided that the, the, like the format or the, the vision of the book was going to, we were going to ask scholars to write chapters that thought that took up race relations and all of them asked the question, how have race relations in the church affected the unity and the division of the church? Uh, and so I'll say that one more time because it was what drove every chapter in here. We, we tried to write a book where everyone was asking, how have race relations affected the unity and the division of the churches in America? But we obviously had a lot of folks, everyone writing was from some Stone Campbell tradition. And so we, we have a lot of Stone Campbell um, content in the book, but it's also broader American Christianity. So, so this has really been on my like professional radar really for about five, five or six years. Uh, so I have, I have learned a ton um, in the last five or six years and it has just been, um, yeah, it, it's been a, it's been a really wild journey and it's, it's created all sorts of opportunities to talk with folks like we're having today 
um, here in Knoxville and all over the place. And so I really appreciate that. This is really good work to do. And so again, thanks for having me. Um, and I look forward to the conversation. Great, wonderful. So um, we have a lot of questions that were sent in advance. So we'll start with a couple of those. But for those of you on the call, if you have questions as we go through, please post them in the chat and then um, we will call on you at different times during the, the conversations because we don't want to just stick to the questions that were sent in advance. We're open to live questions as well as the discussion I'm sure will provoke some more questions. Um, and so uh, obviously if you uh, speak, then unmute yourselves. So I suggest we start with a prayer and then uh, we'll move on to the first question. So Otoma, would you mind praying for us? Sure. Father in heaven, thank you so much for today, just for allowing us to come together to really just uh, see what we can learn from history. I pray that you'll guard each one of our hearts, that we will uh, really just try to take in what we can and uh, really just uh, use it to try to live out the kingdom the best we can here on earth. We do realize that uh, none of us uh, lived in the time of slavery on either side, but uh, Father, the, the impact and the repercussions come down still to us to this day. I pray you'll give us just a great wisdom in our understanding and uh, how we take everything in. And again, that we can find some great solutions to really just uh, honor you in a great way. Be with uh, all of our discussion. Praise in your son's name, amen. Amen, thank you so much. And I think, Otoma, the first question is yours. Yep. So our first question, I know um, one of our, many of our good friends, um, Mr. Michael Burns, and I'm sure others have, you know, discussed how there are, you know, different narratives as to how we see history. We may look back at history and, of the United States specifically, and we may say, you know, yes, we look at uh, the Declaration of Independence, we look at, uh, you know, the Boston Tea Party, Independence, Thanksgiving, all these kinds of things. But I think there's probably also a second story that we should also consider, not that one is wrong and one is right, but we need both of these stories to really understand our history. So if you could maybe just share a, a quick timeline of the history of the United States, including the following elements, Jim Crow, Reconstruction, Redemption, the Civil Rights, and something I, I learned, perhaps I knew briefly, the Second Redemption. Yeah, um, that, that's great. And I think what, what maybe what I'll, 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 I'll focus on maybe the history of the U.S., especially as, as it regards race relations, maybe. So think about slavery and, and, and the, sort of the ways that we've um, especially major turning points, race relations, I guess the very, you, you all know that the very beginning um, in the 1770s, the American Revolution is actually, you know, slavery go, goes, goes way back. It's, it it's becomes race-based in, in the 1500s with the creation of um, the idea of races. I'm going to go into that right now, but what happened in the 1770s in terms of one of the most important moments for race relations is the new political ideas about um, people having inalienable rights to, to freedom um, that, every, that, that folks were you know, really excited about um, in the 1770s, those forced for the first time a major public debate about slavery. Uh, and for the first time, a whole lot of people because of this new um, vision that all people have these inalienable rights, um, a lot of people were saying it's wrong to own people. And so you get this massive shift in all of world history. This is like really where it's in your face. And that's the question that, that this whole country is founded on. Like the tension is there. Like, how do you build a country that supposedly is built on this idea that all people have inalienable rights, while at the same time, you, that country practices involuntary hereditary slavery. Those two don't go together. So like the, the question is how, how did they do that? Well, a lot of them thought it was wrong and, and demanded an end to slavery. Um, economic things happened and, and racist things happened and uh, slavery was allowed to exist um, even, even with that major um, contradiction. So that's how the country really gets started. Throughout the 1800s, before the war, right, we have two distinct regions develop in America. There's the northern section and the southern section. Um, and differences, especially over slavery, between those two sections lead to the Civil War and the Civil War is fought, right? And then you get abolition. And that's what I would call the first civil rights movement, 
where, you know, you get, uh, and, you know, we, we call it reconstruction, but you get the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments to the Constitution, and those abolished slavery, provided citizenship, no matter your heritage or your ancestry or your race, um, and they, they supposedly demanded the, the vote, or they legally gave people the vote, um, Black men, that is, Af men of African ancestry um, of, the, of, you know, a certain age. And so those happened in, Recon you know, in, in Reconstruction tries to force this new vision of society society where formerly enslaved people would have rights um, and uh, it didn't as, as you all probably know that didn't pan out very well especially in the south uh, and so what we get is after reconstruction there's the reconstruction is this period where the federal government takes over militarily in 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 the south breaks it up into five regions with a general over each one and tries to force, requires them to write constitutions that actually get behind the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. Uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't sign on, they wouldn't ratify the 14th amendment. So the federal government kind of takes over with the military and forces this reconstruction of society. What happens though, over the next you know, 10 years or so is that slowly but surely um, the white Southerner, white Southern men who had been in power get back into power. Uh, and they take back over government, take back over political uh, systems, and they create what we call Jim Crow, what we today call Jim Crow America or Jim Crow era. Um, and this is the era where basically, I mean, that just means uh, legalized segregation takes hold. And so a racial hierarchy is retained. Um, instead of slavery, now you have um, laws that ensure, um, especially at this point in time, people of African descent would be you know, at the very bottom of the racial hierarchy um, and white men would be at the top. Um, that slowly but surely gets chipped away through all kinds of efforts, especially of the black community. You have major leaders. They develop in the early 1900s, the NAACP, um, which is still one of the major organizations that fights for civil rights uh, for African-Americans um, and other people of color. Uh, and then you have other organizations too. So you get this long civil rights movement. You have people like Ida Wells exposing lynching culture. So there's this, there's this moment from say the 1870s up to the 1950s uh, that we call Jim Crow era. And it's just a really, really bad time um, if you are a person of color. Um, because, you know, we have over, over 4,000, actually, I think we're getting close to 5,000 um, racial terror lynchings that we know about. That's not even the ones we don't know about. Um, where, you know, and a racial terror lynching is one that was, didn't see any judicial process. It happened by mobs and everyone went, you know, went free. Um, so it's a really bad, a really bad time. Um, but you have also movements, again, especially from, uh, from the black community to start challenging these things legally. And eventually then the more, you probably know more that the fifties and sixties civil rights movement, um, then comes and it starts really coming after and tries to make sure, for instance, the right to vote uh, and the right to have jobs is enforced, at least by law. Um, and so that's the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s. What happens then after that is we have this new era, um, historians and sociologists often call it the colorblind era, where you have new policies that are passed with the, where they like, you know what, what's really going to be fair and what's really going to be equal is we'll just not mention color in the laws, uh, assuming that everybody's kind of starting on the zero yard line for a 100 yard race, um, which basically neglects, it, it, it refuses to take account of historical effects of slavery and Jim Crow. Uh, and so we're still dealing with, with colorblind era, colorblind racism. Um, and so that happens, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, of course. And now, you know, especially in the 2010s, we're in what I would call the third um, the third civil rights era, a second reconstruction, maybe you might even want to call it second reconstruction could be the 1960s. And some people call what we're in now the third reconstruction. Um, so we got a first civil rights, a second civil rights and a third civil rights. We're in that right now with Black Lives Matter. Um, and what we're really at, what we're, the, at the forefront of the conversation today, as we continue to re re reckon with colorblind policies and what they're doing in society, um, we're really focusing on policing uh, and mass incarceration. Those are kind of the big things at the forefront. There's lots of other stuff as well. So that is a not so brief, I guess, but that's a history of uh, thinking about how race um, has, has played a part in U.S. history. Uh, before we go on real quick, can you also just cover briefly the redemption and second redemption? Um, uh, what it, tell me what exactly you're referring to. The, the basically the pushback to all the progress that has been made. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, that's what Jim, I would call that's what Jim Crow is. Is that what you mean by redemption? 
Yep. Yeah, and also, also the second one. Yeah, yeah, it would be post 1960s. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So every time we have progress, anytime there's racial progress, there's always massive backlash um, from those who are in power and feel you know threatened and feel like they're losing power and just don't want to share power or view others as inferior. And so that certainly happened um, in the 1870s and 1880s and 1890s. That was what drove the pushback. So basically, immediately when you get the new uh, amendments uh, in the 1860s after the Civil War, what you get is Southern law, Southern states immediately pass what we call Black Codes in 1865 and 66 that keep Black, that keep African, formerly enslaved people, as close to a state as bondage as possible. So things like you can't you can't vote, you can't carry guns, you can't uh, organize or you know gather in public. And so that's that's kind of the pushback. That's why you end up getting reconstruction. Um, and there's a whole society developed. We actually call it the lost cause religion in the South, where you get evangelical politics and the former racist society and ideals about white supremacy that come together and, and really are, are a new civil religion that dominate really until the 1910s or 1920s in most Southern states. And maybe we would talk about that as we go. So that would, I mean, if you're talking about, you know, redemption, you know, the redeemers are actually literally, they called themselves these white folks who took back their government uh, from the Northerners who were trying to enforce them, you know, to adhere to this new vision of society society where formerly enslaved people of African descent would be equal. Uh, and so you get that massive pushback and the same then in the 1960s, right? This is when you also, all these moments also, by the way, of when there's massive pushback, this is when you see the Confederate flags and the Confederate monuments erected. You know, we, 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 we have those charts. You can just see it. You're like, oh my gosh, they're always responding to this move forward. Uh, and so in, after the you know, in the 1960s and after you get massive, massive pushback um, and all kinds of stuff, again, using colorblind language and colorblind policies, we literally have the highest level political, um, you know, politicians in like in the 1970s and 80s just straight owning that yeah we were we were saying you know busing and we were saying econ economics we were saying da, 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 but what we meant was you know what we meant was black you know and so these were colorblind policies that had clear uh, racially discriminatory outcomes and effects and even sometimes intentions but we could just you know we're, we're, we're using these colorblind language and i would say we're in a third kind of like massive pushback right now this is what we've seen with white christian nationalism um, and there's a there's a chapter in the book from Joel Brown where he really covers the way the inner workings of white Christian nationalism, how people are operating with this with this vision and this view. And so it's a it's a it's a wild moment right now where you see again, you know, we had our we had a first black president, and the 2010s have been the most racially like the racial turmoil of the 2010s and so far 2020s have just been unlike anything I've seen in my in my lifetime. Um, you know, and I was born in 79, so I haven't been around that long, but in my lifetime. So that would be, is that, is, did that, did that yeah, cover yes. what you, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. In the book, you st I think you're the one who wrote this. I wasn't sure if it was the part you wrote or the part you edited, but uh, there's a saying that the structures of Christian churches in America bear the wounds of racism. So can you expand on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, probably what, especially what I'm thinking there is, um, you know, and it, this goes back to MLK, um, you know, Martin Luther King and, and others who have said, who were, who were just acknowledging the fact that we serve in the church a savior who broke down every potential barrier that humans place between themselves. Um, and it is, it is an utter tragedy that, when we gather to worship that savior in our society, we are as segregated as any racially segregated as any other time. Like when God's people get together to worship the ultimate desegregator, uh, we segregate more than more than any other time. And we do that because of the historical sin of racism. I mean, we don't we don't gather in these different communities because like we've never been together or because we just have different cultures or something like that. I mean, this happened historically for a reason. Um, and, and the reason is the sin of racism. We have, we have the record and we can tell that story. I say that because I oftentimes get, and, and I, and I've only gotten this pushback from older white gentlemen who say, um, you know, well, we're, we've just developed culturally different culturally. Surely it's not, that's, uh, that's like, okay. Right. Like, I mean, I have this cultural group that I like to be with. I'm like, well, on the face of it, that sounds right. But the reason we developed culturally 
differently is because of the sin of racism. It didn't have to be this way. Um, and so why I am, while I'll be reticent to say like, oh, let's everybody just chuck everything and like get right back together because people get wounded in that way, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not oblivious to some of the safety that comes, you know, especially with uh, communities of color um, for a long time, you know, worship has been one of the few safe places. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I, I want to acknowledge that and not be like, oh, let's just, you know, let's just ruin that. But at the same time, um, we, we got this way for a reason. Um, and um, I, therefore, I think we can get to a better place um, with some careful, careful work. So I, we're segregated. And that's, I think that's awful. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I think this question is uh, similar to that. Um, and it's actually really kind of the whole reason I think the book was written. Uh, and the question specifically is, can you, can you please share how slavery uh, long shadow impacts us even today as Christians? So I know you elaborate, elaborated on that a little bit as far as having, you know, 11 a.m. is the most segregated hour, right. as Martin Luther King said. But uh, any, any more uh, specifics you can share uh, yeah. as far as that? Because I, I know even one of the things that was mentioned was, even how the Bible is read, you know, uh, African Americans in those times, and perhaps even today, depending on their station of life, read the Bible differently than 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 white people who are right next to each other in the same church, worshiping the same God. I don't know if there's anything you can share about that. I mean, yeah, absolutely. So I I, I, I was thinking like, you know, where do I even begin? Because each of these stories to draw to draw out the shadow. Because a lot of like just I'll be like just make sure everybody's on the same page here. A lot of people today, especially folks who do not experience um, the effects, the people who are sort of like blind to and outside of the effects of racial discrimination and how we continue to deal with it, are just think that like well we we dealt with that in the '60s, 1960s, and like yep. now the laws are fine and everything's good, so just stop talking about it and it'll go away. We can actually trace. I mean. It takes careful and diligent and hard work to trace the effects, but the, they are not hard to, they're there, right? So, I mean, so you might say something like Bible interpretation or the way that we read, which is one of those fundamental things. Like, so a lot of white evangelicals today, which are the people I work with most uh, here, like I, I teach at Johnson University, um, at predominantly white evangelicals coming to this. I mean, um, won't, you know, We'll, we'll see the Bible and when they're reading the, the broad story of scripture as, you know, Jesus who comes to save the individual and get them like to heaven, right? Um, whereas in the black community from very early on, a much richer and I would say a more genuine story of God has been discovered and embraced, which is a God always seeking shalom to make things right in the world and inviting God and inviting God's people to participate in that making things whole. That's what the kingdom is all about, you know, when Jesus, you know, preaches Luke 4. And, and African-American biblical inter interpretation has always found God as liberator. You know, James Cone says, you know, one of the major the uh, theologians of liberation, black liberation theology, um, he says, like, if you read the story of scripture and don't have a primary characteristic of Yahweh or God as liberator, then you're outside the Christian tradition because that's what Yahweh is. And so I think because the commu the black community has experienced um, such oppression um, and other marginalized groups as well, you know, biblical interpretation and the story of God, there are, there are things that people in power have just missed. Uh, so that's one. I would say other ones. I'll just give one example. Um, I think the most obvious shadow of slavery would be mass incarceration right now. Um, so a lot of people are aware, but a lot of folks aren't. And so, you know, after slavery, what happens is, you know, this is part of that pushback, the redemption that you were talking about in the second redemption, where sl after slavery, you know, immediately white people in power criminalized blackness in all kinds of ways to retain the racial hi hierarchy and made it pretty easy to put black people into prison. And the 13th Amendment, you know, some of you all know, some of you may not, the 13th Amendment says we'll no longer have slavery or involuntary servitude except for criminals right and so it leaves this big hole and what you get then especially in reconstruction is this criminalization of black behavior of blackness of black culture um but then you know and jim crow carries that on but after the civil after the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s then you get this massive push for the colorblind stuff but then you get the war on drugs 
you know, in the 80s and the 90s. And all of this stuff is extraordinarily racialized, where you have this, again, the, and it all goes back still to slavery, and then after slavery criminal, criminalization, and then the war on drugs, you get, you get these things that are just so messed up, like the type of drug that the Black community is, is using, you know, is penalized and criminalized and sentenced at, you know, at one point, like 100 times yep. more strenuous than the same drug in the form that the white community is using. And we've just only recently started to chip away at that racialization of, um, of criminaliz- racialization of the criminal system. And so what you end up with is just insane amounts of black people and people of color in the in the prison system because of this war on drugs and all of it, there's this direct line from slavery. And so all this is a legacy of slavery. So I've just done with mass incarceration. We could do the same thing with housing, with education, with yep. wealth um, and so on. And historians are telling those stories. Um, Atoma, I think I saw in your, you know, you, you maybe had recently been reading Richard Rothings, Roth, Rothstein's The Color of Law, you know, he tells this story um, about housing. But anyway, the legacy is, is, is enormous. And for me, I, I think one of the things I would say as well is as we trace these, and as, as people learn about these, people willing to learn about this long shadow and how drastically it affects us today, um, we have to, I think we have to start using the language of um, moral injury like societal moral injury. I, I think this is one of the things that, because a lot of people that I work with, like, so if you think about the white evangelical community today, they'll say, well, look, okay, that sucks. But like, I didn't participate in that. So like, why is yeah. that my problem? Or what, you know, like, I'm good. Um, I'm not racist. And my friends aren't racist. And so, you know, and I love everyone. And so what's the deal? Let's just move on. But when an entire society is swept up in yep. this massive campaign of moral injury and fails to live by moral standards, it has this catastrophic effect, not just on individuals, but on all of society. You know, it's, mm-hmm. we would say maybe systemic, but I mean, policies, procedures, ways of living have yep. been affected in this. And there are these vicious cycles created, and it doesn't just end with slavery and it doesn't end with the Voting Rights Act, right? Today, people are marching again because we continue to deal with people, you know, messing around with with making it hard to vote and targeting uh, certain communities. And so when we have these moral injuries and we can trace how society has been injured, we have to work for moral repair. Um, and I think that's one of the things that the church ought to be leading on. We have these tools. We have the theological tools. Um, we have the call ethically. Uh, and so mass incarceration, others, you know, all of these places are, 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 are places where we've got to start talking about moral injury and moral repair. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, for everyone who's on the call, we will entertain live questions as well. So if you have a question, please post it in the chat. Uh, but it doesn't look like we have any right now. So Otoma, feel free to move on to the next question then. Yep. Sure. So I know as I was going through and reading this book, uh, I did not know I did not know this individual, but Doug, Doug Foster is spoken of uh, very highly, which actually makes me want to learn more about him. Mm-hmm. Um, can you please share about kind of like uh, the impact he had on your life? And also, uh, in your opinion, the trajectory of racial reconciliation in the restoration movement, which I think most all of us here are a part of. Yeah, um, is. Yeah. So, um, again, so Doug, I I went to grad school and and learned from Doug from 2005 to 2008. He became, um, you know, my major academic mentor and also a spiritual mentor. Those of you who know Doug, he is um, like, I don't know anyone who know who knows Doug and does not absolutely love, love Doug Foster. He's everything I think that I aspire to be thinking about like, I mean, he's this warm and kind person. He's got this deep spirituality that just exudes when you meet him, you know, you know, he's been formed by the spirit um, and the spiritual disciplines and he's a top notch historian. And so when I, when I was took him in classes, it was the first time I was ever like deeply challenged. Like this is really going to be hard to get an A, um, you know, cause he, he, the, the high demand of, excellence but he was i think teaching a class i don't know if it was a wednesday night or a sunday night and he, he's, he's an elder there at mentor lane um church of christ in abilene texas where i was at grad school and i went to his um you know it was either wednesday night or sunday night class and it was college students and like there was nowhere to sit i mean this is the kind of you know 
command Doug has over people. And so like, I'm just like, okay, I guess I'll sit over here in this corner or whatever. And he was, I think he was teaching, I don't know if he was doing a whole series on the book Blink um, from Malcolm Gladwell, or if he was just using it as a reference, but it was one of the first times I had ever encountered this idea of unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. And I was terrified and mortified thinking about like how my, you know, reflexes may be maybe harming people or damaging people. Um, and so like, that was where the first sort of lights came on for me with Doug and Doug helped me, you know, start my, my projects and everything. So, and, and you know, honoring Doug was the reason this book came about. And if you're going to honor Doug, you got to do stuff with race. So Doug has been working for racial justice and racial unity and reconciliation in the academy and in the churches um, for a long time. And so, you know, Jerry Taylor actually writes, um, you all may be familiar, Jerry Taylor, um, he's, he's heading at ACU, um, the Carl Spain Center for, I think it's called racial, um, I don't remember exactly the terminology, but in, in spiritual and spirituality. So thinking about race and spirituality and, and working for this racial justice and racial uh, reconciliation movement. He's got a chapter in here that's all about Doug as an example, you know, and Doug's constantly starting, you know, starting organizations in, in the academy, organizations in the church that bring people together from very different backgrounds to breathe deeply and to pray and to lean into understanding our history so that we can have a brighter future. So um, to go into all the initiatives, you know, would, would probably be too much right now, but, but I mean, constantly sees the need for creating a new initiative that will get more people around the table and that will demand justice and, and unity. I, I like to say justice first, because a lot, again, a lot of people I work with uh, among white evangelicals want to talk about unity first. Uh, and I like to say, you work for justice and unity might happen, but that's where we've, that's where the white evangelical community has failed ever since the 1970s racial reconciliation movement. I've always wanted unity, have wanted to hug, have wanted to like chill together, but not be in solidarity with. Uh, and as Jamar Tisby and others have said, like you work for justice, you end up with a community that's rich and diverse. You try to, you try to just work for diversity without justice and you're going to end up with a trail of wounded people. Um, and so I like to say racial justice and racial unity, because I think there is actually is an order there. Yeah. It seems like to me from what I gleaned was he was definitely a man of hospitality uh, and yes. caring, as you mentioned. Um, he definitely uh, tried to put together structures, not just relationships, but structures yes. that would, you know, work to make sure that we had a better society in the future. And I think because of his, he was a man that was in a high position of power, he also was able to help influence some of those structures to start caring more. So thank you for highlighting him. Absolutely. Great. Um... So I had a question. Uh, one of the frustrating things in having discussions with a lot of my friends, the older white uh, people, um, you know, one of the tenets of American Christianity within that community is the idea that Christians should stay out of worldly matters, or what is called worldly matters, and that we should focus on individual sin, and uh, not systemic sin. Anything with the word systemic uh, creates a reaction. Um, you know, uh, and the whole idea that the best way to change the world is through changing the hearts of individuals. Um, you know, this seems to be a serious obstacle to reconciliation. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit more about that? You talk about it a lot in the book, yeah. and I just find that very, you know, super interesting. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And I think this is the most important thing for understanding what, you know, what historians and sociologists today call the racial perception gap. That is, white white people and people of color view the world in extraordinarily different ways um, they're perceiving the world in very different ways and white evangelicals perceive everything to be based on individual choice and individualism um, and are unaware of and oftentimes unable to even see how systems and structures could influence or affect <laughs> or somehow inhibit individual free will choice um, so there are, and here's the deal so I think that view, that view of like, it's the gospel is all just about individuals, um, nothing about the world, social issues aren't part of the gospel. I think um, that is fundamentally and fully shaped by American culture and American religious wars. Um, and I can show you where that's been created and fundamentally anemic in its vision of the Bible. 
like to read the Bible from front to back, the story of God, as I said before, is very clearly a God who creates and brings his people to work for shalom, um, to set things right. And the Christian hope, <laughs> the eschatological hope, the entire, like our hope is in Christ who will finally, you know, consummate the kingdom and make all things right. But right now we work hard to, to partner with God in building shalom. I like to me, if you read the Bible front to back, that's pretty obvious. But when I say this, the, this individualism that is, that is so rampant in, um, wh- especially white evangelical circles, this real, I mean, it starts, er, it starts early on with evangelicals, right? So evangelicals, f- for those of you who are not fully aware, a basic tenet of evangelicals is this idea that you're born again and, you know, God, God you know, creates you anew. And that's the major point um, uh, at which, you know, you're saved. And so, and that's the, that's all the gospel is all about that. And evangelicalism, as it arose in the 1730s and 1740s, made that the, the front and center. That's what Christianity is about. Christianity is about getting to a revival and getting born again, having the spirit change your, change your mind, change your heart. Now, that, that surely is part of the biblical story, but in American culture where you really get white evangelicals hardening on that line is in the early 1900s, because in the early 1900s, you get a progressive movement that starts building in, in Christianity, and that progress, part of that progressive movement is, is this thing called the social gospel, and so the social gospel argued that, and this is like 1900s, 1910s, they're, they're looking around and seeing the effects of what we call the Gilded Age, you know, from the 1870s to 1900, where, you know, capitalists are allowed to run rampant and are not regulated whatsoever. And so people get really, really, really rich. And you have all kinds of people in the cities just devastated, right? Kids working, people dying, working 16 hour jobs, and it is a mess. And people in the middle of that, and pastors in the middle of that, especially Walter Rauschenbusch, articulate this idea like the gospel has to be a concern about that. The gospel has to be concerned about the way he put it, saving structures as much as it is about saving souls. You can't have one or the other. If there is a structure that is oppressing people and hurting people and killing people, that is wicked and evil. And Paul talked about those, Mm -hmm. right? Those are the powers. Those are the principalities. And the gospel says, I'm coming after you and I'm going to save you, right? Uh, I'm going to redeem you, and I'm going to make a structure that makes it good for all people, that seeks shalom. And so the, the social gospel said that, and they're progressives, though, who are saying this, right? And so what happens in the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, you get religious wars between the modernists, who are progressives, and the fundamentalists, who are conservatives. And that pits these conservative revivalist evangelicals against the social gospel, and they mm-hmm. go all the way into a corner like, I tell you what, it's just a ludicrous vision of the Bible saying, no, 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 no. The gospel's just about individual souls, just mm-hmm. about saving souls, just about saving souls. Th- those, those liberal progressives over there have it all wrong. They're trying to take captive the gospel and make it all about social issues, which they mm-hmm. weren't doing. I mean, Roush and Bush always said it's both and. It's both mm-hmm. and, it's both and, it's both and. And so what happens in the 1940s and 1950s, those things get hardened. And guess what happens in the 1960s? Mm-hmm. Martin Luther King Jr., the social who is who is the social gospeler he's using the social gospel and all all the architects of it explicitly to say look the kingdom the kingdom the kingdom is about society too and white evangelicals harden and they say nope and not only are you a social gospeler now you're a communist because um, all and yeah. a Marxist and all that stuff and we, and we see that still today these rhetorical these rhetorical um tropes that are disconnected from reality and disconnected from historical facts um, are thrown around then. And then then white evangelicals get even harder, hard lined into that. And so in about 2000, there was this study done of white evangelicals. So that's historical. That's why I say this comes from the religious culture wars, not from a reading of the Bible, uh, not from a reading of the Bible. Um, I think the Bible is very clear that God is concerned about the whole package, about restoring relationship between people and God, between people and people and between people and the earth. And any vision of shalom that does not take care of all of those, is, I don't think is reading, reading the scriptures very clearly. And yeah. so this study came about in about 2000. Um, I'm looking because I don't want 
want to miss the name. And you, there, there's a question later on. Uh, Emerson and Smith do this study. It's called Divided by Faith. And yeah. they're sociologists, right? And they're doing over 2,000 interviews. And they have all this, all this stuff. And they're trying to ask, what on earth is wrong with white, with white evangelicals? Why can't they get their minds right on racial issues? Why are they so different from almost all people of color? Um, you know, and the way that people of color view these things. And they found, you know, they unpack in a lot of these different ways. I'll just make it simple, like in, in a very basic form. They said that white, that white evangelicals see the world in individualistic terms. Yeah. And they, all people are individually accountable for their own actions. So people are free to choose the good or the bad, regardless of social circumstances. They think social circumstances don't have anything to do with it. And most of these white evangelicals aren't, like I said are already, aren't experiencing sort of these historical historical discriminatory structures that are baked into our system right now. And so they say then, therefore, when they look at mass incarceration and see these insanely disproportionate numbers, they aren't seeing the long shadow of slavery and all these things that I just mentioned that lead to the, the racialization of our system, of our prison system. They see, they see and point to the poor choices of those individuals. Right. And the only way to fix that then the only way to fix that then for them is to fix the individuals. And the way you fix individuals is through relationships. And therefore, you have this whole vision of the world that says the only fix is individuals. And the only way to, to fix individuals is through good racial, good relationships. So we need to have, you know, up the up the up the relationships um, and the social problems will change. You make a you make a born again person. And teach them how to be in a good relationship with, say, with their family or something, then that will change society, not the other way around. And that's 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 basically kind of where we're at. And I know I said a lot there, Nadine, uh, about this whole individualism thing. In my view, this is the fundamental thing yes. that I try to help my white evangelical students understand. Um, and and the racial perception gap, this viewing of the world, perceiving of the world in such drastically different ways based on your race is again a cultural phenomenon and i think christians rooted in the gospel story would actually view this in you know some different ways yes this is this is excellent and michael actually had a question in the chat that is related to this so uh, michael if you want to unmute yourself and maybe share your question um yeah so let me get back to, um, yeah, so I said, um, you know, I'm a white person, obviously. Um, I have a, a black wife and, and two black boys. So I, I read the first three chapters of, of the book and I, I felt hopeless for the future, thinking that another split in our church is inevitable between what, what we just discussed, individual sins versus uh, social slash climate justice issues. Um, I know we have people that want to focus on evangelism and individual repentance, but don't feel like the issues, uh, systemic, like systemic racism or climate change should be brought up in church. Mm -hmm. um, what, would, what would you say to a minister that thinks pornography is a greater concern than racism in the church? Yeah, I mean, that's tough. So one of the things that I've been thinking about is, um, A, the major division in the church since the 1970s is between the right and the left. Um, historians and sociologists are unpacking this. I, I call it the fragmentation. Others call it the restructuring. But in this, since the 1970s to today, you know, especially with the culture war, you have folks that are kind of like on the right of side conservative and folks on the left and pr a person on the right, a Baptist conservative and a church of Christ conservative will have much more in common than a church of Christ conservative and a church of Christ progressive. Um, that's this idea of the fragmentation. And so I think this is going, this is going in that, like this, your question there is, is tapping into that. But what I'm learning is, and I'm, I've like been, I've been reading psychologists a lot, like social psychologists, especially in moral psychologists to try to make sense of right now. And, and sometimes that also makes me feel hopeless. But one of my favorite is Jonathan Haidt. Some of you may know Jonathan Haidt. He's, uh, his, his book, The Righteous Mind is uh, sort of made a good splash in, in the 2010s. Um, but what he argues is that all people, just like you have taste buds, um, all people have He's, he says it's about six psychological foundations for morality, right? So taste buds for morality. 
And when you understand what's firing for moral issues, so what's really the concern for society, it helps you understand, you know, how to respond, for instance, to a question like yours. Because right when I see that question, I'm thinking, well, that minister is appealing to purity and thinks purity is a more significant moral concern than fairness. And fairness and purity are both moral taste buds that we all have. But if you've been swept up into the stories of the current conservative concern, then what you're really concerned about is, is purity, traditional family structures. And so you need the family to be cohesive and pornography is part of like coming at the family um, structures, the typical hierarchy and the typical thing that makes society go round. Um, whereas for progressives, fairness, fairness is, is a, and harm at, at the very top of the moral taste buds. Um, and so my knee jerk reaction is to want to unpack, okay, that is a fair concern because, you know, purity and sanctity is really important for morality. Um, and, and we should be concerned about that, but so is fairness and justice. And these are not either or issues. Uh, and that either or dichotomy is not the gospel. That is these silly culture wars that have been framing I, what I see framing in all groups, but especially right now, conservative white folks, uh, to see the gospel story as this one tiny little thing. Uh, and therefore, they appeal to purity, they appeal to sanctity, and justice and fairness are mm -hmm. way down here as moral concerns. And I just want to come back and say, they, it's got to be both. The gospel says both. The gospel can't be reduced to this individualistic piety stuff. It just can't do it. And so I'm going to want to unpack the psychological stuff going on, the sociological stuff going on, but also the historical stuff. That person has been very, very shaped to see the either or stuff. And I want to throw grenades at all of it and say that's not the biblical story. It's both and. Um, we've got to be concerned about all these things. I don't wow. know if others wanted to chime in on that as well. but Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, That's easy I for me feel, to say right from my office. <laughs> yeah. I do feel like what you touched on um, in reference to the theology, uh, specifically seeing the Bible individualistically, is huge. And yes. I don't know if you teach that at your school. I know you've been trying to kind of go through those aspects. But if you teach that specifically, I really think that's the cr one of the main problems we're seeing. Which I think even right now, if you look at if you look at the some of the people who have been most impacted by COVID, it's been communities that just want to be individualistic and think that hey, I want I don't I don't have to wear a mask. It's just about me and my choices, not taking anything else into into account. And actually, I looked at a map. It's very similar to slavery, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Because that was the same. I hate to say that. I mean, you know, if someone can argue with me, that's fine. But it's like the South. The South has this is just me and my way of doing things, and that's very dangerous. But qu moving on real quick. So in your book, you mentioned um, how Black churches uh, started. Um, can you sh please share about that briefly? And also, is there also a danger today that we could have the same thing happen where Blacks feel like they're not really being listened to in their churches, and they're just like, you know what, I'm done with this? Yeah, no, that that's absolutely right. So his, thinking historically, um, black churches, independent black churches arose almost immediately in the north. Um, and the first one was in the 17, like 1790s. Most people uh, would, would say Richard Allen and Absalom Jones. They left a white um, church because they were experiencing racism at the church. The story is pretty famous. Um, they're trying to pray. They're trying to sit somewhere and pray. And the white usher comes in and just trying to move them. And they're like, let's just wait till after the prayer. They're like, no, you got to sit in the balcony. You got to be second class citizens, basically. Uh, and so what they do is they leave and they start. Eventually, it's called the AME Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And then there are a number of others in the north that develop uh, as well throughout. You know, this is right at the very beginning of American history. And they're, they're always, almost Almost always leaving uh, because of white racism that they've experienced in in the church. And so what happens then is in the South, though, you know, where, where, in, where slavery is still going in the 19th century, um, some black communities were allowed to worship separately. Uh, anytime that there were revolts, though, that usually got tightened down. And usually you have like a white person who is who is watching over the group. 
um, the genuine, the real genuine, authentic black worship happened at what we call hush harbors or brush harbors, where the black community kind of moves away from the white gaze and have have these authentic moments. And we know about this because so many, um, so many enslaved people wrote narratives about these genuine worship experiences. But here's the big narrative. The, the, the fundamental axiom that of what, when black churches started is as soon as it was legally possible, almost all black Christians left white churches due to racism and started either their own congregations or their own denominations. So that by the 1890s, the church was almost completely segregated. Oftentimes white church members, you know, helped and they said, yes, we don't. And usually it was because we don't want to worship with you. And we think we should be segregated. Again, the society had shaped their vision of how the world should be and what the gospel was. And so they just went with segregation uh, and they said, here's money. We'll build you a building so that you can be over there. In fact, there's a famous debate in churches of Christ with David Lipscomb weighing in, David Lipscomb actually thought black and white people should worship together, even though in his argument about this, his, you know, his subtle racism comes out about him viewing black people as inferior. Um, but nonetheless, there is a big debate, but I mean, a lot of churches of Christ are like, no, they're, they're, we should not be worshiping white churches of Christ. We should not be worshiping together. We need to be segregated. So that's, the, that's the story. It, it's a story of the 19th century and it's remained that way really uh, until today. Um, and, you know, to the last point, you said, you know, is there a danger that uh, blacks will leave churches uh, if whites, you know, don't see um, the churches listening to them? Um, and absolutely, yes, absolutely, yes. Um, you know, there's a movement right now for multiracial churches, um, and that's been a big part of, you know, the racial reconciliation um, emphasis. And I think, you know, those are really, 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 really difficult to make work if they're actually going to be multiracial churches. And, you know, ICOC probably has something to say about this, um, especially as, the, as that's one of the folks that really, you know, because of the structure have led to more inter, uh, multiracial churches or multiethnic churches. But nonetheless, um, these have been hard because almost always, almost always there's going to be a dot, you know, there are dominant cultures and without thinking about the dominant culture and, and analyzing it, people fall into ways of, of worshiping okay. and being that are, you know, shaped by, and people are expected to assimilate into that dominant culture, which, you know, usually if, if you're in the white church and that's going to be white dominant culture, it's very, very difficult to somehow actually blend cultures um, and so there are people that are coming at the multiracial movement and saying, you know what, maybe this isn't the best way forward. Yes. 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 Yeah, I think multiracial, multicultural, totally two, two totally different things. Yes. Yes. I be, believe David Swanson wrote a book, uh, Rediscipling the White Church, and he kind of talks about that, um, which I think is a very helpful way to look at things. Absolutely. So uh, Sherry Simpson, I know you have a question here. I didn't know if you wanted to ask it. Um, if so, did you want to jump on and ask it live? If not, I can ask it. It's up to you. Um, I'll go ahead and ask it. The question is, who's responsible for the acknowledgement of racism um, in our churches? And specifically, I mean, you may or may not know the structure of our church, International Church of Christ, but the point here is that people of color seem to know but our white brothers and sisters don't, especially in our leadership. So maybe just some thoughts, you know, as a, just a general point, what, why, why do you feel like the, um, for those who are predominantly in power, in, in our case, it's the, it's the uh, our white brothers and sisters, why, why are they not able to see when it's very clear to African-Americans? Yeah, um, from, my, from, from my experience, it seems to me the only time people become aware and can see um, is when they either get in solidarity with or become inquisitive and listen, 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 experience, experience, experience um, that other perspective. I like one of my historical, like thinking historically, I've got this. Um, I guess it's a hypothesis. It might be a thesis by now um, of what is it? Is there anything in common through history that the prophets share? Is there anything that made people able to rise above their time and space to sort of like get rid of the blinders 
and speak prophetically in their time and in their place? Um, is there anything that they share in common? Is there anything like that Frederick Douglass and Ida B. Wells and James Baldwin and MLK um, and, you know, William Barber II today, maybe, or Jamar Tisby or, um, you know, or William Garrison, you know, a white man in the 1830s um, who rises up and like gets it. Is there anything they share in common? And the only thing, I, the only things that they share in common is either they were experiencing oppression and they were speaking to it, or they got in solidarity with people who were being marginalized, experiencing oppression and saw the world from their, from their view. Outside of that, I think people will continue to be totally clueless. Uh, and so it's going to take a real willingness to cultivate curiosity, to be to develop a posture of listening and inquisitiveness, and to listening to marginalized, to oppressed, to people who are experiencing um, the things they're putting voice to. I, I don't see any other way to do to to do that. And so I wish. I, I like. I don't feel like it's rocket science. Uh, I wish I had a better answer for that. I don't know if if others want to add to that. I would love to add something if I may. Um, what I've been focusing on in my show, as far as the last two episodes of mine, I um, it occurs to me that in order to help at least people in the kingdom. I don't know if this applies to the rest of the world, but at least in the kingdom, I've been making the argument that of, of how racism and its different iterations actually undermines our mission to seek and save all nations. Yeah. It actually, racism actually seeks to undo that. And it makes it impossible. We're actually driving all nations away. They're not streaming to us, we're driving them away. And I think that if you can look at it from that perspective, like, whoa, there's a problem with your mission. I think, that is a, I think that's probably a better way of grabbing an ear than it is racism is wrong and we're doing it, you know, that, that kind of thing. Because they don't see that for reasons why you, that you explain. They, they, look at the, they look at the world completely differently. And until they look at the world differently, um, that'll be a very difficult racism. I mean, it will be a very difficult argument to make. But if you can point out that there's a problem with our mission, I think that's enough. That, that's something they can relate to. Yeah. No, and that's that we're good. not representing the image or the kingdom that God wants us to represent. So thank you. Right. Thank you, Justin. I'll add to, I'll add as well, just thinking like in terms of the technical language, um, you all, some of you probably have read Christina Cleveland. Um, and her book, Disunity in Christ, um, which, which is a great book. But so she's, you know, she's a social psychologist. So she's bringing her psycho psychological tools to try to understand why people can't get along. Why, why, we, why we, you know, basically an answer to the question, like why, why are some, so many people like unaware? Uh, and, and the terminology she uses is contact theory. And that's basically what I was saying, you know, be in solidarity with or get in solidarity with. But I've never seen any sort of proposal for ra racial reconciliation um, that doesn't include this. Like individuals have to be in relationship with one another to be aware of. Now, I'm not saying that the relationships is the, like, I'm, don't, don't hear that. I'm not saying relationships is the, is the only way forward. Um, but that's always a piece of it because, and there are studies too. I, I've seen several studies done um, that show the, the turning point, when, when white people do become aware of the experiences of people of color, that's when they shift their perception, you know, and the, one of the studies, I'm looking at the book, um, what, what was the, um, it's the end of white Christian America right, by Robert Jones, he shows a few of these studies, you know, he's a major um, pollster, you know, he, he, he's the CEO of one of the major polling organizations, and he's showing that, and he's citing some other folks that do that, like, one of the, one of the like one of the absolute requirements is to understand other people in a real deep and genuine long lasting way i'm not talking about just like you know pulpit swaps i'm talking about deep deep personal relationships and then all of a sudden the windows open like oh my goodness you're experiencing that um, and so that's another way i think that folks can be aware and awakened to but i, I mean i love what justin was saying there um, about um 
yeah. I'll add one last thing and we'll move on is the other thing is theology, because a lot of this to me comes down to theology, because you can even say like, you know, stop listening to that news channel that's teaching you wrong. And, you know, that, well, I don't know what that does necessarily, but I think like, re, I almost think we need to be retaught some things or recalibrated or whatever the nice way to state it is. I just don't think we read the Bible correctly. Maybe it's starting with the Sermon on the Mount and understanding how, you know, uh, we're all connected and we're all meant to live out the scriptures in community and not individually. I think if people are able to start seeing that along with what Justin mentioned and what you mentioned, I think those perhaps can start breaking the ice in uh, some people's hearts. So thank you. Yep. Great, thank you so much. Uh, the next question I had, I think has been answered already. So I'm looking at the chat here and Stanley, Jocelyn, you have a couple of questions here if you want to unmute yourselves. Are you still with us? Um, did you uh, yes, we're still name? here. Okay, go ahead. Um, well, I had uh, a few questions here, but um, uh, I'll ask, uh, I just, my last one was, isn't being clueless on this subject a salvation issue ultimately? I mean, you've touched on it being, uh, uh, some others have touched on it being a mission issue. How can we, how can we um, administer to the mission? But for me, um, uh, just a little background on myself, you know, I wasn't raised in a, in a religious background at all. Um, so my, my, uh, my conversion was uh, one of, I, I, didn't, I didn't have any uh, religious um, upbringing to fall back on, if you will, or to argue with. Um, and so for me, uh, becoming a Christian was changing from the inside out. And so when the Bible says that it's not, sin is not, what comes from the outside in but it's on the inside and then comes out and so ultimately even though our mission is to make disciples and, and, and help change this world if we're not conscious of how of the sin or things that keep that from happening then isn't it a salvation issue ultimately and not just a mission issue i mean that's a that's a fair question i'm very careful my personally um, I'm, I'm a true child of the early Stone Campbell movement. I love unity and, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm slow to say, oh, this is what's going to get you in. And this is what's going to cause you to be out. You know what I mean? Um, I want to have a bigger, I want to have a very big vision of, uh, a God. I think maybe a, a, another way to put this would be, um, a sin issue and absolutely yes. You know what I mean? Um, so yes, I think it is sinful to not acknowledge moral injury and, and not to come after moral repair. Um, and so, yes, this is absolutely um, a, a sin issue. Um, anything that destroys other human beings or hurts other human beings is antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, you know, that's, that's really, really serious. And so, I mean, other people might want to say, yes, absolutely. You're, you know, if you don't get right on this, then you're not getting into heaven. I'm just not sure about that. Um, you know, we all need, we all need grace and we're all on a journey and we all got some stuff together and other stuff we got to work on. This is a, this is a massive issue and it's a gospel issue and it is a sin issue. And so I think that's where I would maybe, I don't know if others want to chime in on that. Well, I'll, I'll keep moving on with the next question. So the next question I have, and this actually addresses, um, I think, a question that um, Tony had noted also in the chat. It's kind of got some similarities. But the question is, when disciples of Christ who are in the north predominantly split from the Church of Christ, which is in the south, what role do you believe that slavery played in the split? And kind of a follow-up question to that is do you believe that our culture impacts our theology? As in the disciples of Christ, they lived in the, the North, so slavery wasn't the, 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 the basis of their economy, um, but it was in the South. So because of the culture of the South, the Church of Christ needed to have slavery continue. So they found theological ways, <laughs> they found, the, I'll say it again, they found theological ways that made sense to them to perpetuate slavery. Um, and kind of a bunch of questions, but I know you got them in front of you also. If this is the case, what's the best way to combat this tendency, which is culture? And we have culture coming at us right now. And, right. you know, I posted something in a group and it was like the end of the world. 
because of culture, not because of reality, in my right. opinion, because of mm -hmm. culture. So if you can maybe just address that. Yeah, no, that's good. And maybe this is a, a part where I'll say, like, I think one of the things that we're learning right now in the postmodern context is the importance of to the importance to, I'll say, epistemology or to say it maybe without using that big word, um, the way that we come to know things is through story. Um, okay. Story story is how we are coming to, to our, like, that's very clear right now that it's not like these objective facts out there that are convincing people today. It's the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are and what's wrong with the world. And so I actually think this goes back to what you were saying earlier, Atoma, which is, this is a Bible issue. Like, I think, I think that getting a biblical imagination is missing right now in mm -hmm. so much of Christianity. And so you, you know, you could say it's culture. Uh, you, you could say it's story. It's the stories that people are believing and the ways that they're, they're wind, winding up their worldviews and living into those things. It's not shaped by the biblical imagination. Correct. Um, this idea of like, Oh, the fundamental reality for me is doing what's best for me is like antithetical to the gospel story. Yeah. Um, and so when people are saying that, it's like clear that the worldview that is shaping them, the story that they're living into is not, or it's only partially, it's been hijacked. It's not the gospel story. It's not the kingdom story. It's not the biblical imagination. So, so yes, coming back to the historical question, slavery was huge. I would say sectionalism was the massive thing that like the overarching thing that caused the, the first major division. Um, slavery was certainly a major part of that. And a lot of people in the South were, were pro-slavery um, who were, you know, white Stone Campbell folks. Um, and, and yeah, so I would say, yes, it's massive, but it's also complex. You know what I mean? I think that the division was sectional. It was also socioeconomic. Um, it was, you know, all sorts of stuff, but the sections were, I think, the major driving force. And yeah, I think it's impossible for culture not to affect our theology. Um, I, in my view, I don't know that it's possible to encounter the gospel, the gospel without some kind of culture. I don't know that it ever comes without it. In my view, enculturation and the beauty of the incarnation, enculturation is all about the gospel meeting a culture and, in, and, and, the, and, the, and the, the culture meeting the gospel and then being mutually enriched. Like I happen to believe because of the incarnation that when the gospel meets a culture, that culture and the particular ways of them being human actually enrich the gospel as well. Like we learn, we learn new things, uh, new perspectives, new angles about the God that we serve, the God who has been pulling these people in this particular culture to God's self. And so I'm not positive. It's about like, let's just be biblical or have a biblical imagination and, and not be cultural. I'm thinking let's have a rich biblical imagination and see where we can infuse that with our culture and where the culture really helps us live into the biblical imagination as well. But it's, so for me, again, it seems like rooting our worldview, getting our story straight in the biblical imagination about this God who creates and we who break shalom and this God who restores shalom again, in all of the ways people and God, people and people, people and the earth, and then calls us to partner in that. And a Jesus who sets up a kingdom that begins the work of shalom, setting things right where they have been wronged between people and God and between people and people and between people and the earth and us as a church living into that mission, people called to be with God, restorers of shalom, getting that story straight. It's right there in the Bible. So yeah, I think one of the things that we do with students here in Johnson is, you know, we're trying to give them a biblical, the meta narrative of scripture that I'm just telling you right now, you know, and my wife has really helped me articulate the things I'm saying. She's a, she's a new Testament scholar and she teaches this sort of biblical imagination, biblical worldview. And it's missing right now. Even kids who come in, you know, Bible bowl savvy, right? They've memorized all these facts, but when you say, what's the gospel about it's, it's not this, it's not the gospel story. It's this cultural story that they've been swept up into. And it's about me and it's about my rights. And it's about whatever else the issue is individualism and gospels about saving souls and all that stuff. It's like, whoo, 
we got a lot of work to do. And so, so again, on, the, on that last part, what's the best way to combat this? I think we got to get our story straight. Story is, especially right now in our postmodern moment, and I think postmodernism is awesome, like in terms of our moment. I think it affords the Christian church all kinds, all kinds of tools. Like it's a good cultural moment for uh, because I think we've got the best story out there and people are being convinced by stories. And so let's get our story straight, tell it well, and see if we can bring some Christians back into the fold to the biblical story. Thank you. Yep. Todd, your turn. Yes, thank you, Jamie. Um, so I'll share a data point and then I will abstract a question from that. Um, so if we look at, for example, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the way people voted in 2016, um, the, you know, and you could say the greatest voting block for President Trump was the white community, but more specifically, the greatest voting block for Trump were people who identified as both white and Christian. And so it's one thing to say that the uh, white Christians are influenced by the culture of racism. And it's another to point out that perhaps, and here's the question, there is a greater proclivity of someone who identifies as white to believe racist ideas if they are Christian than if they are not. And that is a powerful nuance. Uh, and so what is it about, you know, what are your thoughts on that? What is it about the Christian church where it's not just influenced by racism, but in many ways leading the charge? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. No, that is that is very helpful. Let me bring in another. Um, let me bring in another study. And I'm sorry, I'm like piling up the studies. Um, some of you may be aware of this. Some of you may not. But um, there are a couple of sociologists of religion who have been very, very helpful to me on this particular question that you're asking, Todd. Um, Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry, and their book is White Christian Nationalism. What's the subtitle? I don't remember, but that, that's the that's the title. Or no, taking America back for God. Yeah, taking America back for America back, back for God. It's the mo it's even more compelling to me in making sense of our current moment and the things that we're talking about. It's even more compelling to me um, than the study I was telling you about early the the, the psychological study I was telling you about earlier um, by Jonathan Haidt, which is also very helpful. They they work together. But anyway, so what they find though is the actual strongest corollary or relation to voting, um, for instance, for President Trump, was actually Christian nationalism, um, even more than even more than race. And they, I mean, in this study is like highest level sociology. So they've they've got like six or seven items on their Christian nationalism score. Uh, and then you get a they, they run all it through their machines, you know, and you get a score of like they have like four or five categories. You know, you have an ambassador for Christian nationalism. You have an accommodator, you know, based on your score. You know, if you go, all, you know, you get 20 out of 30 or whatever, you're, on, you're here. So you got accommodator, you got, uh, you know, uh, ambassador, you've got a um, resistor, and then you've got like absolute opponent. And that category helps make a lot of sense of like, what about the 20% of white evangelicals that didn't? That's a big chunk. If it's about being white and evangelical, well, I think white evangelicals have a strong correlation to Christian nationalism, but even higher is if you're a Christian nationalist, and again, this gets, you have to understand it, you have to like get into their definitions and, and understand it, but it's stuff that you're thinking about, right? America's a Christian nation, America ought to be, et cetera, et cetera. Then you start understanding why folks who are, for instance, not even Christian or secular, but still have this Christian nationalist ideology, real high scores, all, can be in line with these white Christians who are all promoting this particular person that that doesn't seem like the one that they would be promoting or whatever. So, um, but let me get back to say, I, I don't want, I, but I don't want to dodge that question either, because I think you're right to point this out. Even if Christian nationalism is the sh is actually making, I think, the most sense, racial racial hierarchies are as essential to Christian nationalism. So one of their one of the components of Christian nationalists is that these are people who are traditionalists. They want to uh, society to adhere to all the typical traditional hierarchies, including racial ones. 
Um, and that's where it's like, oh, okay. So if you're a white evangelical, you're more likely to want these kinds of hierarchies to still remain. Um, that's a really, really big deal. And that's a problem. And so, yeah, I think it goes back though to Todd, again, speaking more directly to Todd's question there. Um, I think it goes back to this individualist mindset. Um, white Christians, uh, and again, I'll point to Robert Jones's study of the end of white Christian America. He demonstrates in there white white people in general, but especially white Christians don't know people of color like closely. They're like in their close social network, less than 10% of white people understand this. So contact is gone. Uh, and Jones is, is saying that as well. So contact is gone. Then you also have these white evangelicals with the, with the toolkit of individualism. And the only explanation for anything out there is individual, individual, individual. Well, then, you know, the Republican Party this last time and maybe Trump really appealed to that. Um, and so you get all of these things going together, I think, and you got some real issues. I think it's a multi-front problem in terms of what's what's the fix for balancing that out, maybe, or whatever. Um, hopefully that made sense. I know I just went in a lot of different places. And if you want to come thank back, so that's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We only have about 10 minutes left. So Otama, I know you had a couple of important questions you wanted to ask. So I will let you um, ask those questions. Okay, so um, we may get back depending on time, we may cover some other ones, but we wanted to try to cover these um, before we wrapped up. So you did mention divided by faith a little bit earlier and uh, some of the issues there in terms of individual versus collective faith. Mm -hmm. So we don't necessarily need to uh, kind of repeat some of those items, but um, if you can maybe share just very briefly from Divided by Faith, I know there were three things that are mentioned in Divided by Faith um, that really make it hard for, for white people to really address racism. I think you may have mentioned some, uh, maybe a couple of those previously, but also, um, you know, the question after that more specifically is, how do blacks and whites view the solution to racism differently? So the first is basically divided by faith. You know, what are, what are the different ways that people view things? Um, and then just, uh, you know, what are, some, what are some solutions that blacks and whites can look at as far as this uh, process? Okay, yeah, that's good. So um, just to, the, the terms, you know, you, you mentioned this and they're on page um, 122 of Slavery's Long Shadow, but free will individualism, right? So we were talking about that. That's the belief that individuals are not guided by structural or institutional forces, but by their own choices. So it's this real failure to see how policies affect daily life, even when those policies are clear. Now, historically, I think it's it's we can unpack that stuff like, oh, look, here is a law, a policy that let white people get loans for houses and did not afford the same thing to black people. That's a policy that creates racial disparities. Uh, and so I think some of these can be worked against, but this is just how, how white evangelicals are walking around. The second one is relationalism. That is the belief that personal and local relationships are fundamental over and against social and systematic and systemic issues, right? So the, the fix is relationships and then anti-structuralism. That is a rejection of explanations for phenomena such as racism and poverty, or like I said earlier, mass incarceration are based on structural um, influences. So that's, that's, that's a major issue. Whereas, you know, on the studies, that's just not the, like the question, for instance, do you believe that um, the recent shootings of unarmed black men is a systemic, is, is, a, is a broader problem, or is it basically bad apples? And on that question, and this, this study is in Robert Jones's The End of White Christian America, it's devastating because, you know, 85% of black people are like, absolutely, yes, it's a problem with the system. But then the, the more white and evangelical you get, the more white you see the world. So all of white people are about 50%, you know, saying, yes, it's a broader problem. But the other 50 are like, no, nah, it's bad apples. You know what I mean? They're, they're not aware of this long shadow that we've been talking about, how deeply that affects um, the, the world. I think a lot of them can be, be made aware of that. But, but, but then you get to white evangelicals and it goes down to like 28%. 
You know what I mean? And so there's like a 50% racial gap. It's like we're living on different planets. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's a real, real issue. You know what I mean? And so that's, that's what we were talking about there. Um, and therefore the views to the, the, the fix are massively different. And that's one of the reasons you see the alignment in the partisan alignment that you see today. Um, is this going to be individual and let individuals take care of it and, and, you know, pull their bootstraps up or whatever, or are we going to collectively work on this and um, view this as a collective problem? And, and largely today you see partisanship going that, those two, those two directions. And so um, if you're experiencing these structures, you, you understand it's a structural issue. If you're not experiencing them and you know, and you know zero people who are, and you also believe everything's individualist, well, you don't, you don't, you just think it's bad apples. Um, it, it, that's a, that's a, you know, that's the best I can do explaining those things. Okay. No, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, next question, just moving on And Richard, uh, T Hughes, a chapter that he wrote, which is resisting white supremacy. He basically talks about how, uh, some of the incorrect ways that our theology is formed. And I think we kind of discussed that. So I guess we won't necessarily delve into that unless you wanted to add something to that. But the next part of the question is in reference to um, the Disciples of Christ. They basically put together 12 initiatives, um, like ways that they wanted to start tackling racism and just equity and so forth. Mm -hmm. Can you please maybe just kind of list those, maybe share a few words about each and maybe a little bit more detail on the 12th one. That was of particular interest, interest at least to me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, to for quickly, so Richard Hughes, his article is basically saying a lot of what we've been saying. He's saying for too long, churches of Christ uh, have read the Bible through cultural lenses and therefore accepted slavery and accepted racism and accepted white supremacy um, and accepted segregation. And today, you know, accept colorblind ideas and accept whatever, you know, on and on. And he says, what we need to do is view instead the culture through biblical lenses. And so I think the way I would put it, you know, and especially for him, he says the ethic, the, the New Testament is an ethical vision of the kingdom of God. Um, and we need to take it up. And, you know, he likes the idea of still restoring something, even if it's not some kind of pattern, restoring the ethical vision of the kingdom of God and reading our culture through that eth ethical vision. And I think we've been talking about, it. I think the biblical imagination is what we need re to restore. Um, uh, and then on the disciples ch uh, chapter. Yeah. And so this was really cool. The coolest thing about the disciples chapter in here, uh, Newell Williams did this, but um, uh, Camilla Hall Sharp also um worked on this and she is doing um she is doing uh womanist interpretation she's down at bright uh and so she's an exciting new scholar almost has finished her phd or maybe she has by now and she's also a preacher and so um really appreciate her helping out on this as well but there was a lot of interviews done about these 12 initiatives so for those of you who don't know this chapter lays out 12 initiatives that disciples have kind of done um in regard to racism and, and first of all, it's the it's black agency. That's the very first one. I think they did this on pur on purpose. When we're talking about history, a lot of times we we're catastrophic and we talk about what has been done to, um, and, and we when we forget to talk about resilience and and black uh, uh, culture and and beauty and resistance. Uh, and that's what they're talking about here. So the first thing on the list is Preston Taylor just straight up, you know, they just start a black convention in 1917 is when that happens. The same is happening in churches, acapella churches of Christ, the black community, black churches of Christ just start their own journal, uh, eventually have their own net networking fellowship, have their own college because they are so tired of white racism in uh, white churches of Christ institutions, right? And, and the same is happening for the disciples. And so that's one of the first initiatives. Then the initiatives, I'm not going to mention them all, but integration does happen. And, and there's a lot of 50s and 60s, the conventions do finally come together. Um, they worked for to get the seminaries to accept black students. And they're already doing that in the 1950s. It sounds crazy to say already. But again, they're ahead of the other white Stone Campbell institutions on trying to integrate um, calls for civil rights. They joined some of those, you know, but they were always eh. a lot of disciples were even angry that MLK was going to speak in the 60s, you know, on at one of the conventions, and he ended up having to be on a panel instead of like preaching because of white resistance. And so that's all shaky, right? But you do get a, a, the merger call for social responses, call for affirmative actions and uh, action and policies that that and I should probably note that like, 
colorblind policy says we assume like everyone, as long as there's just an equal chance, an equal policy that like doesn't see color, then that will achieve equality. Whereas affirmative action says, no, actually you're starting on the 80 yard line on this hundred year, hundred yard dash. And you're starting on the minus 20 because of the historical circumstances and powers that you know, privileged some and disadvantaged others. And therefore we need affirmative actions or color conscious policies to set things right. And so the disciples have done some of that, um, uh, tried to grow various uh, ministries, including Hispanic ministry, Asian ministry, tried to found some new 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 congregations that were eth ethnic, but that, that hasn't been the great one. And then the final one that you mentioned is um, becoming an anti-racist and pro-reconciling church. And that's an initiative um, that is ongoing, right? So they have a whole anti-racist ministry um, that provides education and work awesome. and organization tools and stuff like that. Uh, and so again, I'm not um, affiliated officially with the disciples, though I have a lot of friends who are disciples and I'm and I'm in organizations that are disciples as representative of independent Christian churches, but they're doing really, really good stuff. So just real quick as a summary for that, do you, do you feel like the disciples of Christ are doing a better or the same job, or how would you compare that to the church of Christ based on these initiatives? Just your, your thoughts. Overall better. Um, overall, they're plugged into the ecumenical movement. So they've been part of naming racism, owning it, repenting of it. Um, these long historical historical moral injuries. White, a lot of white, a lot of white folks, including in the churches of Christ, can't even do that. And I've never seen a reconciliation platform that doesn't start with repentance for the moral injury of the past. And because of white individualism, again, this is part of that. Like I'm not part of a collective and I'm not part of a body. So like I'd say all about me and I didn't do anything. So why would I ever have to repent? Uh, and so the disciples are, are, are a lot of them anyway, are doing that now that obviously they don't have all their stuff together, but in terms of organization and stuff like that, I think they're ahead as a group, they're ahead. There are people though, in churches of Christ doing really, really good stuff. Um, Jerry Taylor, for instance, and, and the Institute there at Abilene, they're doing, they're doing really, really good work. So, 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 you know, and, the, but by and large, you know, white churches of Christ have a long way to go. Okay. Um, I think we can probably do one other question, then I'll do the last one that I have. And um, I'm kind of combining a little bit of a question. I think I think this was from Mike Huber, um, but I'm going to modify it slightly. I think it was from him. But it's basically, you know, um, like so systematic systematic issues are very clear to uh, African Americans. So we're like, oh, man, come on, you know, how can you not see that? But it's not very clear sometimes to our, our, our white brethren. However, they're very clear on things like Q QAnon or the welfare queen or all these kinds of things. Why do you think they can see systematic issues in one situation, but not in another? Yeah, that's tough the story. I mean, I feel like it's still that story issue, the story that they're being swept up into, uh, because that, those are contradictory, like, you know, for instance, systemic stuff, I would say like with welfare queen, or even if you want to go with like abortion, which I think a lot of white evangelicals would come after and they, and they see that as a systemic issue. Let's go get judges and let's pass laws. I mean, that's systemic Correct. solutions, you know, um, whereas this over here is like, oh, no, no, that's not systemic. So there's contradiction there. Like that's just straight up contradiction. However, we know that People and again, I'm not a psychologist. I've read enough though, because they're making a lot of sense. And you know, they, they make a lot of sense of this stuff to me. Um, people can deal with that. They can deal with heavy duty tension. They can deal with cognitive distance as long as the story's got an the story they're living by has an answer. Um, and I know the gospel is a part of it, but it's been co-opted, you know, uh, it's been substituted, um, and, and changed. And so I think it's part of, I, I'll, my best answer is this a, is the story they're living into and B they're they don't have friends who are helping them understand that those real experiences, because as we know, by the studies, very, very few white people have, um, black people and people of color in their close circles to where they would actually be able to experience some empathy. And that is one of the major ways that we will see a turn, a turn away from, you know, this trope, this just absolutely ludicrous and not based in fact, for instance, the welfare queen stuff, or that you actually do care about systemic issues and you think systemic solutions are good here. Uh, and I just think, yeah, I mean, it, it's the story that people are living by and have come to believe and are telling themselves over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that question that was from uh, Marissa. That was from Marissa. Okay. Um, so in, in your in your work, what have you seen as far as some of the uh, things that have worked best in terms of trying to help people? Um, I know you do obviously teaching. Do you focus on like the Sermon on the Mount? Do you go through uh, the, the, the Gospels and try to understand what, you know, what are some things that you found that have worked? To me, um, and again, you all, like my, my, my context is primarily I work with uh, white um, young adults, um, though I also work with, with others as well. I still think coming back to the, the starting point is uh, there are two key issues. One, understanding the biblical story and what the Christian gospel is. That's like what's at stake here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's always a starting point. The second thing is uh, history, like when people are aware of the history and you and you do the hard work of tracing it, mm -hmm. there's just no rebuttal. Yeah. Like once you understand, like, no, no, look, this is the law and look what it did. And then this is the next law and look what it did. Mm -hmm. And then look, we have the study here on the racial disparity of income, for instance, uh, because homes were, you know, not included. That was a privilege of white people. Like you go through that and you're like, therefore, look, here's the inconclusion, <laughs> the disparities we're experiencing. And we ought to do it. like, so those are two different things. They work in tandem, I think. But what is the what is our calling as Christians? Is it to convert individual souls and ignore those what happens in their bodies in society, or is God of the God of the Bible bigger than that? And, and so that's big. And I think we I think even people that have the Bible memorized don't necessarily understand the biblical imagination, the biblical story that we're that we ought to be swept up into. And that's got to combat these other stories. Some of you all will be aware, maybe and have read Lee Camp's. Um, recent book called Scandalous Witness, uh, a political manifesto for Christians, in which he argues Christianity is neither right, left, nor religious in the sense of individual salvation, but instead a politic that is a way of being in the world where Christians living into this kingdom imagination, this vision of being going about restoring um, shalom, are ad hoc always negotiating how we. Uh, respond to the powers. Um, we got to get that back. And then again, I think hist history is extremely liberating here. If again, and not everybody's willing to do the hard work and there are all kinds of voices, you know, somebody wrote in some new questions in the last minute about why do keep, why do people keep pointing me to Candace Owens? And why do people keep pointing me to uh, Vody Bottom or uh, Bachum, is it? Um, yeah. And I, people, I, 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 I get that same stuff. Um, these folks are, you know, sometimes I know well-intentioned, but being very disingenuous, not telling yeah. the full story, not telling the full story, not being honest about very important stuff. Candace Owen, somebody just sent me a video yesterday and said, help, help. And like, she's just like, they're not telling you that white people ended slavery and yay, white people and yay, America, because they ended slavery. I'm like, what? And slavery's always existed, you know? And I'm like, no, you left out the part about race-based slavery and the construction of white supremacy and the creation of race. Like you left all that out and, and that's all baked into it. So got to be honest. So, I mean, again, th this telling honest, good, genuine history. And again, I'm biased. I'm a historian, right? I'm a professional historian is a powerful tool against these false stories that people are being swept up into. So okay. those, those are big ones for me. Last question, and then the dean's going to wrap this up for us. Last question is just in reference to some uh, solutions. I know you've we've definitely covered some very heavy topics, but I wanted to end with some uh, solutions, some takeaways that can perhaps help us in our individual lives and our ministries. So one of the things that was uh, done uh, in the 1960s, there were a lot of racial reconciliation workshops, which, wow. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, wow. That's That's awesome. Can you yeah, maybe share by about the black churches of Christ mostly, you know, that leading that effort? Sadly, you know. Yes, right. Uh, can you please share about, you know, some of the solutions that came out of those workshops for us today, things that we can consider that we can work on? Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, so if you all don't know, you can you can search like 1968, the Atlanta statement, uh, which is awesome. And I still when I'm teaching civil rights in my restoration history course, uh, I print it out. You know, I've got the copy right here. Um, because like this stuff's not rocket science and most of it would still work. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's just actually having the will, um, having ministers and elders who are 
prophetically savvy enough and willing to put put it on the line um, because I mean you're going to have to put it on the line the political and congregational and theological will to enact these things that sometimes make us uncomfortable and hard and you know create tension as MLK said you know like you're going to you're going to you're going to prefer this peace rather than justice with tension like it, it, that, that just won't work the Christian gospel is going to have tension uh, to it so yeah some of my favorite stuff I mean what the very first thing okay the very first thing that they do on this on the like th there are these workshops but after they do these workshops they make this statement right the 1968 Atlanta statement and they acknowledge the existence of racism <laughs> first thing wow. own it that's huge. We, that's huge the, right, there. right? I mean, yes. <laughs> it's one of the, like, I, I mean, I spent, like, I, one time I committed myself this whole year, like, I'm not reading anyone but Black authors, because, like, you know, that's the voice I need to hear. And not one of the books I read uh, left out, you know, one of the things that we'd really like to hear is white people just own it. Hey, this is real. And I'm sorry. And it's like, it's real. And so, that's always on there. And I've never read a, a legit platform that doesn't say we start by acknowledging it's real, which again, a lot, a lot of folks can't currently do because they're unaware and they need to become aware. We acknowledge, we acknowledge this. We, the undersigned individual Christians, acknowledge the sin of racial prejudice, which has existed in the church of Christ and in our institutions and in our businesses. And it says, because we love the church of Jesus Christ Christ, and we want to see her fully committed to the principles of equality and racial justice for all people, we plead for the end of racial discrimination. That's awesome. In all of its forms, in the life of the church. And then they go on to list all these ways that local churches can do things, institutions could do things, um, the TV Hero of Truth could do things, publishing companies could do things individuals could do things and so they're all things that you all are already like what we're doing today that's one of the things on here right have workshops we got to keep this conversation going um all of them i think probably you you could say or maybe come together in three four five big things that are always i think part of any mo movement forward one owning owning what's going on mm -hmm. um right now and ha and being willing to to take up the studies and educate oneself, um, listen to the voices to repent. This is so hard, but I've never seen any reconciliation platform, any movement forward that doesn't start off with acknowledgement. Like why would any Christian ever have a problem with repenting of wickedness and moral injury that our society was caught up in? Um, that makes no sense to me. Um, you've been duped by these stories about your individuality that only means anything, that you're not caught up in this story, in this society that has, in fact, historically been involved in moral injury. So we must repent. Um, and a third thing is find ways to work for racial justice. I mean, this is just not rocket science. Um, research local organizations, research national organizations, research worldwide organizations in your community, your individual, you individually, you can, yes, corporate repentance. I, I'm seeing Nadine say corporate repentance. Yes, communal repentance for any wrong ever done. Uh, done. One of the things that um, I, I'm jumping, jumping around, I, let me finish that last point. What was I saying? Um, oh, yeah, get involved in justice work get involved in justice work. I think the rest will work itself out. There's all kinds of things that we can do, but if we acknowledge, acknowledge it, repent of it and work to write it, all three Christian mandates, I would say of the gospel, um, the rest will work itself out. That doesn't mean it will be easy, but this is not rocket science. It is hard, but in terms of the steps we take, one of the things that, um, one of my favorite books, now this is a hard book, all right? So people that aren't along the journey a little ways might wanna you know, start maybe with Jamar Tisby's How to Fight Racism or something like that. That's pretty easy to handle, but uh, Shaniqua Walker Barnes is, um, I Bring the Voices of My People, A Womanist Vision of Racial Reconciliation uh, is, is phenomenal. Um, and, but she brings, she brings the thunder. So you gotta be ready. Um, but you know, she talks a lot. She's, you know, she talks a lot about moral injury and the reconciliation movement in South Africa, you know, Desmond Tutu and others who have led this stuff. There is no way to move forward from moral injury and the level that America has it in our past without full truth telling like a full on accounting of, and a reckoning with our past. And we haven't done it. We haven't done it as the church. 
We haven't done it as society. I mean, like, can you imagine walking around in Germany and having a bunch of statues up to the Nazis? Yet here we are in America continuing to celebrate self-avowed white supremacists. Um, we have got some stories to tell. And until we, we know this from the like Truth and Reconciliation Commitment in uh, South Africa, Commission in South Africa, moral injury cannot have repair until the truth has been told. Yeah. We must tell the truth. Historians are doing it. Will people listen? More historians need to do it. So, I mean, that's part of owning it, part of repenting and part of working for justice. You know, we don't need like 18 professional historians to do this, but we, we have people doing it and telling the story, moral repair and that justice work won't just happen if we don't acknowledge the things that we've done in the past, uh, repent of them and try to, you know, m make amends in some ways, repair those things, right? And this is a big debate, you know, reparations, how do we do this? Well, it's not easy, but the idea that we ought to repair moral injury to me seems uncontroversial. <laughs> now, how we do that, let's, let's debate. Let's have a vibrant debate about that. We can't even get Congress to debate it right now, right. which to me is unfathomable. We can't even have a debate where the halls of debate are supposed to happen. Um, we, we got work to do. We got work to do as a, as a nation, as a church. Uh, and so I know I'm going on and on about this, but I deeply believe that this is part of the, part of the issue. Justice works not just about forward looking. It requires a, back, a backward looking and accounting and, and recounting the, the, truthful, you know, the truth of the past. So those are big things, I think, that you can hang your hat on. You can search and, you know, there's 20 or so. I force my students, I'm like, Choose your top three from the 1968 statement. All right, choose your top three for your communities that you're part of. And they can't choose because there's way more than three in 1968, right? The, 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 the situation has changed. Racism has become a bit more subtle for people to understand because of colorblind uh, issues, but it's still there. And, and the solutions are still, or solutions or ways to work for justice are still very similar. Uh, not to go on and on, but like, the first part is the hardest, I think, owning. And we live yeah. in a society that don't want to own nothing. Can you say maybe just a, a few words on like, how do you uh, help people who don't feel like, hey, that, hey, that wasn't my people. I, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. Yep. Uh, yeah. I mean, again, I don't know that we're, we're at, what's working against us right now is the entire narrative since the 1970s of the fragmentation because the story that is being told on one of those sides of the fragmentation is that you are only responsible for yourself, only the things that you do matter. Uh, and to, I mean, I don't wanna pretend like this is something that is easy to work against, but for me, and again, I'm a historian, um, I feel like understanding what has happened and how, are pe and how people that you're, that you're part of, the community will help that. I think create, cultivating communal conscience would be great. That's also biblical. We're part of a group. We're part of a community. We're part of a society. Um, I think using language, as I said, starting off, and I've said over and over, about moral injury in a society and collective trauma uh, in our society of all of us, right? Like all of us have like the idea of white supremacy and the ways that my society has made me, helped me imbibe that and, and want me to believe myself to be white is traumatic. Like, that's evil and wicked. And uh, all of us have been swept up. And so thinking about communal consciousness and how moral injury affects all of us, spiritually, individually, and communally, that's just work that we have to do to sort of smack people out of this hyper individualism that we're in right now, obviously in a spiritual way, right? I don't want to like actually beat people up. I'm not, I'm not about that, right? The Sermon on the Mount, no thanks. Thank well, thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, I feel like we could go on for another two or three hours. And that is still... always the problem, right? But <laughs> let let us keep let us go on. Yeah, I mean, like the conversation for sure. Hopefully, in days and weeks and months, we'll continue. Sure, to sure. I so appreciate your passion. Um, you know, you're obviously very smart and knowledgeable, but you're also very passionate. And I think for us white people, we have a great responsibility. And uh, we have to be so intentional uh, about having these conversations. Um, yeah. So thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Uh, we're almost on two hours here. Thank you for everyone who took part here. Uh, thank you so much. I will post the recording on various Facebook groups, including the 
Jim Crow book uh, group, and you can also, um, you know, reach out to me. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. But thank you. Thanks, Otoma, for all your great questions and Jamie for your time. Thank you thank so you. much. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me and everyone for being for being here. Can I throw out, too, that if you're if you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm overwhelmed and all this. Uh, can I recommend one book to you? Uh, Jamar Tisby's How to Fight Racism. If you're just like, I'm so overwhelmed and I just need next steps. And oh, my goodness. I mean, he's really helpful. And he's coming from, you know, a, a Protestant Christian perspective. And he's doing good work and he has an arc of racial justice that I use when I go to churches or whatever to talk about this stuff. So I do want to make sure I leave at least a re there's all kinds of things I've mentioned. But if you're like, I, what do I do next? Re read Tisby and he'll get you thinking. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. OK, bye bye, everybody.